Hello, everybody, um, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this program is part of an AP series called Essential Science Conversations, where panelists and audience members can engage in uh, an open conversation about emerging topics in psychological science. Uh, today's conversation will focus on public psychology. Uh, so what exactly is public psychology and why is it important, especially for um, any discipline uh, like ours, which is concerned with advocacy, community representation, and inclusive service to the public. Um, our panelists will discuss why it's necessary for our field to shift its focus from the individual researcher to a more publicly engaged science. And before we get started, I just need to go over uh, a few housekeeping details. Um, first, many thanks to all of you who submitted questions for today's program when you registered. Um, our panelists have received those questions and they will try to answer as many of those as possible. But you will also have an opportunity to ask a question in real time. Um, if you notice in your uh, Zoom dashboard, there's a, a little button there called Q&A. And all you have to do is just click on that button and type your question into the box. And if you have a question for the panelists, be sure to use that Q&A box rather than the chat box. And we'll be monitoring that Q&A box throughout the program and we'll be taking questions from the live audience um, during the tail end of the webinar. Um, secondly, this program is being live streamed to APA's YouTube channel. So once the webinar ends, the recording will be available on that channel. And for um, those of you who may not know, APA indeed does have its own YouTube channel where you can watch uh, many different webinar recordings, including this one today. Um, so you should uh, also receive an email uh, with a link to the webinar recording about a day after the webinar ends, and that one's going to be coming from Zoom. And then finally, we have an Essential Science Conversations webpage where you can find uh, recordings, slides, and written transcripts of all our programs. Just be sure to bookmark the link and check in often. And I will also share that URL in the chat box in, in just a moment. So without further ado, let's begin. I am so pleased to introduce our host who will be leading today's conversation. Let's welcome Dr. Mia Smith Bynum, who is APA's uh, Senior Director for Science Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Welcome Mia, and at this point, she's gonna take over and introduce today's panelists. Hi, good afternoon or good day. There's many people logging in from overseas, which I think is just fantastic, welcome. I'm pleased to be hosting this session today. And because there's a lot of good content, I'm going to get right into the introductions. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. First, we have Dr. Asia Eaton. Um, Asia is a feminist social psychologist and associate professor of psychology at Florida International University, where she directs the Power Women and Re Relationships Lab. Her lab explores how gender intersects with, with identities such as race, sexual orientation, and class to affect individuals' access to and experience with power. Since 2016, Asia has served as head of research for Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, which is working to end image-based sexual abuse. And I'll say briefly that um, Dr. Asia, um, this, this special issue and her colleagues here um, who've edited this, um, I heard about it when I was a member of the um, Leadership Institute for Women in Psychology during 2020. And um, I knew that this special issue on public psychology was coming. I am so happy that I get to host this session and speak with the authors today. We are fortunate to have with us also um, the soon to be Dr. Anthony Flynn. Uh, Anthony is a fourth year PhD student in counseling psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research, teaching, and consulting and clinical work emphasize foundational clinical communication skills and health disparities. He works in solidarity with local social movements in Madison, Wisconsin, and is a union steward and mutual aid organizer with the University of Wisconsin Teaching Assistance Association. Walking the walk, as we like to say. 
And finally, but not least, we have uh, Dr. Neil Lewis Jr. Neil is an assistant professor of communication and social behavior at, at Cornell University. He co-directs Cornell's Action Research Collaborative, which brings together researchers, practitioners, community members, and policymakers to address pressing issues in society and improve lives. Outside of academia, he is a publicly engaged scholar and science communicator. Welcome and thank you all for being here. And now let's begin our essential science conversation. So as I was saying, I learned that this special issue was coming in 2020 when Asia and I were both in uh, um, participant leaders um, in one of the marquee um, APA programs. And so this notion of public psychology is very exciting, timely, and I would argue groundbreaking. Um, what I'm going to do is present these panelists, I, these questions to each panelist as I have them on my script here, but there may be comments that each of you want to weigh in on as, as we get underway. So first I'll begin with um, Asia. What, is, what exactly is public psychology? Um, when you Google it, we can't find a whole lot of information. That's how groundbreaking it is. So if you could share with us um, a little bit about what public psychology is. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mia. It's great to see you again. Um, first, I want to give credit to all the authors in the special issue uh, and to my co-editors, Dr. Patrick Grzenka, Michelle Schloffer, and Linda Silka for developing the special issue with me and the present conceptualization of public psychology. Um, public psychology simply is science and practice for and with the public, psychological science and practice for and with the public. Um, it's a framework and a set of principles that ask us to reimagine and reorient psychology, to center social problems, to engage diverse publics in knowledge creation, to democratize and communicate scientific knowledge, and to rethink what constitutes psychology and psychological expertise. Um, but that said, public psychology is not an entirely new idea, right? Uh, it has a lot in common with liberation psychology, some things in common with community psychology, open science, a lot in common with slow science, for those of you who are familiar with Isabel Stenker's book. Um, and in fact, when we first started to develop the concept, we thought we were gonna call it citizen psychology, consistent with uh, 2018 APA President Jessica Henderson Daniels um, work, um, and also with Kevin Nadal's work on becoming a psychologist activist, but we realized we wanted it to be even broader than citizen psychologist, which is really individual focused and the word citizen obviously mm -hmm. is problematic in some ways. And so we broadened it out to look at, at structures and institutions um, and policies and practices, uh, as well as what, what the individual practitioner or scientist is responsible for and who they're responsible to. Wonderful, wonderful. And one of the reasons to, to build on that, one of the reasons I was very excited about this um, special issue and, and all of its contents has to do with just my own observations that um, with the uh, ascendance of social media, that many younger scientists, particularly our early career professionals, um, millennials and Gen Z, that they really want a publicly engaged psychology. And so you see a lot of conversations on social media in which people are tweeting about their research, I found some of the, the most um, interesting papers, you know, hanging out on Twitter. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about like that dynamic and how public psychology interfaces with um, the ways that we think about impact for promotion and tenure. Oh, I could go off on this one, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna hand it over first to Neil and Anthony. I'm sure you have thoughts. Yeah, sure, I'll jump in here. Um, you know. One of the things I really appreciated about the special issue, um, so first of all, thanks again for creating the issue. Um, I thought um, it was really helpful to see how many people are thinking about this topic. But um, in addition to sort of diving into the content of what is public psychology and how we think about that, what I really appreciated with all the articles is, is recognizing um, the sociology of the discipline that we're in and how do we think about um, uh, different kinds of knowledge. Um, and I thought the articles all in their own way really talked about um, how if we want this work to be done um, and done well, 
then we as a discipline need to change the way we think about what is good science or um, um, good work and um, make sure that our promotion guidelines um, are aligned with that. Um, otherwise it's not going to happen. So that's another thing I really appreciated um, about the special issue. Awesome. Anthony, would you like to weigh in? please? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Dr. Eden and Dr. Lewis have shared already. I think that when we look at um, the current systems as they exist uh, and take a hard look at them and, and look at, do they ins actually incentivize this work? And I think at present, the resounding answer is largely no. Um, mm -hmm. I think about the distinction between the impact on a tenure application for a single research publication versus a, you know, a community-based project uh, that leads to materially benefiting hundreds of people, right? And this idea that somehow that's going to count less for tenure or might even count less for progression in a graduate degree um, than a paper that, you know, frankly, I don't know how many people will read, right? So I think we really have to think about how are we incentivizing these, in the, within the structure, how are we incentivizing this work? And take a critical look at it too. Awesome. Any, any other comments on that? This is, this is a big one. So any other comments, please do add. Yeah, I, I'll add to that as far as a, a bigger picture goes and a critical look. I would even argue that we need to reconceptualize um, what we consider academic work, right? We have this tripartite model of teaching, research, and service. Where is public benefit in that? Especially for those who work at public institutions. Right, it's presumed to be a part of each of those, but we need to center it. Uh, mm. Public benefit. I, I, I. Even you know, if you look at the national surveys of college and university faculty, they probe teaching, research, and service, and you can do, you can fulfill those criteria without doing anything that directly or indirectly benefits the public, uh, and that's really problematic. I think we should position public benefit as a central process product uh, of academic work uh, that determines the nature and scope of every other activity. Mm -hmm. awesome. If I can awesome. quickly add to that, uh, um, one of the papers, I think it was the Grzanka and Cole paper, um, asked a question that I think um, is useful for us to reflect on. Um, you know, we, in, in this space, um, there's been a lot of conversation about giving psychology away, right? Like we'll produce the work and, and give it away to the public. But the question uh, that the paper asked that I really love was, um, if we went and asked the public uh, if they want <laughs> what we have to give, like, would we be satisfied with the answer they'd give us? And like, that's something I think we really need to think about. Um, exactly building on Asia's point, like um, the way things are set up, we can go about our day-to-day -day work without ever really thinking about what the public really wants um, or would benefit from um, and pat ourselves in the back for it. Uh, but if we really want to do this work well, we have to um, be more reflective um, and incorporate that in our practice. Awesome. Uh, I see a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to try to weave a couple of points in here um, with, with the next question. So one of the questions that was submitted prior to the webinar states, is there a difference between applied community and public psychology and then we have a number of, of um, uh, guests from around the world. And so there may be some differences in terminology here that I want to acknowledge. So we have also a, a query about crowd psychology, which is a new one for me. And then there's some questions about um, population psychology, which, which again, I'm stretching my brain here, but um, and it's, are, are there any overlaps between this notion of public psych and sociology? I could start with a couple of those. Um, there's definitely overlap between community psychology and public psychology. My understanding of community psychology, and I'm, I'm not a community psychologist, is that the community is the unit of study. That's not necessarily the case for public psychology, although they both have interest in social issues and institutions and the relationship between people and contexts. Um, you can be a public psychologist and have the amygdala, amygdala be your unit of study. Um, as far as, what was the other one? Applied goes, well, public psychology is intended to be for the public good. And I don't wanna get into defining what that is, but applied psychology is not by definition. Um, it could in fact be investigating uh, 
how to get more effort out of workers and increase a company's bottom line. It could be finding how to make solitary confinement more aversive, right? These, these are mm-hmm. you could be doing applied psychology on these things, but it's not consistent with public psychology. Mm-hmm. Okay. And related to this, um, so one of the questions is framed this way, and I'm thinking I'm going to tweak it a little bit. So there's a query about like how can public psychology make an impact on our field, how will it benefit the public? But let me reframe that a little bit to say, um, how would you like to see this special issue used by our field? Um, Because the first thing I think about is like, wow, someone finally in a cohesive way named a construct for the moment and kind of put it all under one umbrella. But I'd love to hear your, your, everyone's thoughts about like how you'd like to see this special issue used. I think personally for me in, in response um, to the call for papers for this issue originally, I was really struck by uh, this being a, a call for action in our field, ultimately. I think you know this moment that we are in historically, you know, following the pandemic, um, multiple years of really active uh, social strife out in the streets, um, I think it calls for us to rise to the occasion, to heed the calls uh, that minoritized uh, folks in our field and outside of it have been making for decades, sometimes even centuries, um, and really get it, engage in meaningful partnerships of solidarity with social movements, with organizations that are actively engaged in, in, in change. And I think we see so many examples of this uh, today, whether it be you know, getting behind drug decriminalization and supervised consumption sites, or you know, I have a colleague, Rachel Dyer, who's a reproductive justice scholar, who talks about eliminating fetal assault laws that are um, like in, mandate reporting uh, when treating pregnant people are using drugs. Like those laws are a threat to bodily autonomy and safety of pregnant people. Think about the anti queer and trans bills that are coming up in uh, that have come up in Florida and Texas. Um, I think about uh, really a salient example here in Madison is uh, the development of alternatives to police involvement in mental health crisis intervention, right? Development of our CARES team here in Madison based off the Coots program. So time and time again, there are there are spaces that we have opportunities to leverage our collective power as a field and our individual power as well to move these institutions in a direction towards liberation. I think it behooves us to answer that call. So adding to that, um, there are two other pieces that I think the specialist you can help with. So um, for a bit more background, um, I was trained in social psychology and then entered the field um, in the midst of two crises. One, um, we can call the crisis of evidence um, around the replication crisis of the 2010s. Um, and another one happening at the same time was um, what's been termed the crisis of relevance, um, the, the way that um, many of our studies were being produced were so far removed from the realities of everyday life that it was sort of hard to use them. Um, And I think what the special um, issue does really well is really walk through um, multiple elements to address both of these things, right? So um, thinking about the different ways that we can construct knowledge, um, engaging more people than the college sophomores in the laboratory um, that um, has become sort of the default uh, sample and population of study. Um, the, they, yeah, there's so many um, elements that are walked through within the special issue that I think um, can help the field really think through new ways of producing knowledge um, that addresses the methodological angst that's been in the field um, over the past decade or so, as well as um, make our work more relevant for addressing um, those very issues um, that I think just talked about and more issues that we know are coming, right? Um, you know, we haven't yet talked in this conversation about the, crim- the climate crisis, but that's something else um, that will um, shape the field for decades to come. And the papers just really walk through many um, elements that we can think about to do all of this well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let me see the next question here. Um, how are we to fix systems, systems of power really that have encouraged these individual researcher-based silos? I think I I may have signed up for this one. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it can really begin by recognizing that 
the interests who disproportionately benefit from these systems are motivated by those systems continued replication, right? Um, for the system that you're talking about, sort of these individual style, I might even call it the neoliberal academia broadly. Um, it, you know, it's industry, politician, in some cases, administration who are deeply invested in that system continuing to exist the way it is. I think after we recognize that, I believe it's a matter of organizing collectively to present an alternative notion of what's possible and to build our own base of power that's committed to liberation and presents a credible threat to that con system's continued existence as it exists today. So our systems in academia, they really function to atomize us, to diffuse our collective power, the collective power of students, workers, faculty, researchers, to maintain a status quo that benefits so few at the expense of so many, particularly folks with minoritized backgrounds and from minoritized contexts. And to change those systems, we have to organize collectively and, and distill our power to present an alternative and bring that, atom that atomized power together. Um, we, we can leverage that power to say we're, that we're not going to go on this way. We refuse to replicate these oppressive systems. And my colleague, uh, mm -hmm. Sergio Dominguez, in our paper emphasized that when we, we are contesting injustice and presenting an alternative. And those are, are the conditions that we can shift these systems in exact concession. So just a better world is possible when we organize in solidarity together to build. Mm -hmm. So I will just observe, even just the language that Anthony is using is so um, culturally different from what we think about when we're in um, uh, typical departments of psychology or psychological sciences around the country that it's, it really is like a, from a gra the ground up kind of psychology as you're talking about with the organizing piece, um, which um, is radical, but in all the good ways, I think. Um, I'll just uh, disclose my bias there. Um, let me, there's, and there's a number of good questions that are coming up in the chat. I'm going to try to um, blend them together um, if there was. And so, um, Asia, I'm just going to give you a heads up. I'm going to come to you to talk about the article in the special issue that deals with clinical practice, um, because as, as one of the lead editors for this, for this uh, special issue. So one of the questions that um, has come up is, what can a budding psychology student do right now to assist the community and outreach goals of public psychology. And that is for you, Anthony. Uh, certainly, I, I think uh, ultimately one of the single most impactful steps that we can take as students, and I use the we pronoun there very intentionally, um, is to join grassroots organizations who are engaged in these efforts for systemic change. I think a focus on one's local communities is where some of that, uh, those, that effort can be most impactful. Um, reflecting on where our interests and expertise are and where the need is and get in touch with these organizations to offer our support. Um, this is something that a lot of folks in my department here in Madison, a lot of students ultimately do. Um, I think as far as which organization, as a union organizer, I'd be remiss to encourage you uh, to not encourage you to join your graduate worker union if there is one. Um, local Black Lives Matter organizations, Allies for Black Lives, if that feels more your speed, um, local tenants or homeless unions working on housing issues. Uh, there's DSA and IWW chapters in most major cities who are engaged in credible work. Um, ultimately, you pick your issue and there's probably a grassroots organization working on it. Be migrant justice, prison reform, abolition, reproductive justice, disability justice, you name it. And I think that when we engage and join them in solidarity, we have an opportunity to learn from them, sure. But more importantly, we would engage in what Diana Trujillo refers to as the circulation of capitals. This is the idea that by we extend these organizations and these movements, uh, social and relational investment of legitimacy, knowledge, power, protection, credibility, status that we might acquire through education. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think something that my colleague uh, Rhea Jordan emphasized in our paper is that these partnerships, they're gonna demand vulnerability from us and humility as well. And we have to have that courage to contest injustice even when it feels like we have limited control to acknowledge that we're gonna make mistakes, to proceed with grace and humility, to, to sort of learn the lesson and try again. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, next question, so I'm gonna to go to the one about clinical practice and then I'll come back to the, the pre, um, pretty submitted questions. But Asia, if you could talk about um, the role of clinical practice in really um, uh, 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 um, engagement sort of outside of higher ed, um, I think um, where, you, where you can. Well, I, I am a uh, psychological scientist to, to be clear. Um, but we did have practitioners and clinicians contribute to the special issue, um, Anthony being among them. Um, a lot of the articles that touched on clinical training, uh, clinical practice touched on training, like the articles 
by Neville and Miles on becoming a, a researcher, um, practitioner, uh, activist or advocate. Um, you know, I, I think it, it goes back to how we incentivize practice and science, which goes back to um, our, what we train people to be good at um, and what we train people to excel in and understand and engage. Um, and public psychology is going to require really overhauling our, our teaching and training. Teaching is actually one article type that we didn't get in the special issue that we would love to have. I almost feel like we need a whole nother special issue to cover everything. Um, but uh, Neville talks about training students in a liberation psychology framework. Um, and it, it's a, a really stunning article. Uh, liberation psychology, like public psychology, focuses on science for the public good, science whose end goal is action, right? And working with and for communities. The focus of liberation psychology in particular is a little more narrow than public psychology, focusing on oppressed communities um, and um, uh, social justice, whereas public psychology is a little more, a little broader than that. But um, yeah, I would encourage you to read those articles to get more information on the, on the, the training um, and the clinical work. Okay. And so there's a comment um, in the chat that says um, from Lionel, I participated in some of these grassroots organizations. I feel I didn't fit in because of how these groups act, behave and engage with others. So I think it's important to point out that researching and understanding how these groups act before joining. And so what we're what what the question or comment is really um, pointing out is really a clash in cultures. And so um, uh, this is for the panel. Kind of what what you all are proposing and what your co-authors and fellow editors are proposing is really um, thinking beyond the individual and really the that higher ed um, in the production of scholarship in general is very a regimented and top down. And there are evaluation systems that as, as you all have noted, incentivize the production of a certain type of scholarship. So engaging with community research, it requires relationship building. It may take you a good two years to court a community organization before they say, okay, I'll let you come to my community board meeting and present your ideas, right? And a lot of that goes to the historic mistreatment by researchers of marginalized communities. I know sometimes even if I show up as a black woman um, in my life as an academic, that that is not enough quote unquote street cred to get me in the door. It really depends on the organization in the region of the country. And if there has been historic mistreatment um, by the local university um, towards that community organization. And so a public psychology really, as, as you all said, it centers these kinds of engagements um, and we're moving away from the very cool and useful one-on-one psych pool model, but we're trying to really understand um, people where they are um, with the best psychological science. And so I've made a couple of comments. If any of you could weigh in on um, the challenge of meshing that with university um, and college evaluation structures when it comes to, as one of the articles says, what is good science versus quote unquote bad psychology? Maybe I can jump in. Um, yeah, I, all of those things are incredibly important to deal with. Um, you, you have to deal with those um, issues uh, to do this work well. Um, and that's why um, I think so many of the articles emphasize um, that universities have to take a step back um, and think about what does that mean, right? So um, if you can't do the, if, if doing this research means you're not going to, um, you know, sit in your office and uh, come up with a question on your own, design um, the, um, the study simuli um, on your own in the way that, you know, your disciplinary journal would like it uh, to be done, um, then you might have to think about different kinds of products, right? Um, so um, I think Anthony alluded um, earlier that, you know, maybe the, the end product isn't um, an article in an APA journal. Maybe it's something else that's more valuable um, mm -hmm. to the community organizations. Like, why um, can't those things also count, um, right? Like, what, what would it mean um, in a university um, to say that- Can you speak a little well, more about that, Dr. Neal? Just about like, what are those other things? Because I think that that 
is the secret sauce. We all know universities will never not value a publication. Even I, and I will say as a fan of this work, I, I tell my, my students, no one's ever going to say, why did you waste time publishing that scientific article? <laughs> like, you're never going to hear that throughout your career, right? Mm -hmm. But that is just one output of the wonderful training that we're fortunate to be able to receive. What other kinds of things um, should universities be looking at to value? Because we've got people here from all over the world. This is your moment to really shape <laughs> and influence the impact of this work. And I want to do what I can to facilitate that. What other kinds of products might a public psychologist produce that universities should absolutely value? So I'll pre present it to Dr. Neil first, but please, any of you feel free to weigh in. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear um, a range of answers. I mean, we can think about, so... Um, one of my colleagues, um, for instance, writes a lot of um, shorter blog posts with his community partners, right? Because um, that is much more accessible um, than, you know, the 20 page academic article, right? Um, and um, maybe it's producing videos with, um, um, so we're doing a lot of COVID work um, lately. Um, and, you know, short videos about the vaccines is actually more useful uh, than long technical um, uh, descriptions of how it's made, right? So those are um, some ideas. Um, earlier you mentioned um, sort of engaging in conversation on social media, right? Um, so there are um, folks that I know that regularly participate, um, whether it's like Reddit, ask me anything uh, kind of conversations, like that's directly engaging with people with the questions they have. There are all of these things, they take time, they take effort, they um, require building trust, um, and are meeting people where they are and communicating in the ways that matter to them. And uh, universities can count that if they want to. And there are other academic um, entities that have uh, done this. I know the Mayo Clinic almost 10 years ago now, uh, for instance, started counting social media engagement as part of their, uh, no their um, evaluation criteria because they realized like, that's actually an effective way uh, to communicate with people about their health, which is at the end of the day, their mission, right? So um, if our mission is to, um, serve the public, um, then we need to broaden our view of what that actually means um, and value the um, different ways of doing that. Awesome. Awesome. Would the other two panelists, would you be interested in weighing in? I'll jump in quickly. Um, some other products, uh, evidence of impact beyond you know, journal articles and, and their impact factor and what that means would be uh, policy change, right? Or evidence mm. at trying to make policy change, right? We we did uh, collaborate with uh, this this legislature le legislator who introduced this change to this bill, and it didn't go through. But but we spent the time doing this, or it did go through, but not exactly as we wanted. I've I've had that experience. TV and radio segments for public education. Um, curriculum change in schools that you can you can demonstrate that you've accomplished white papers that are that are written in um, everyday language that aren't full of jargon that are accessible to people. I worry a little bit about the social media engagement because that can be kind of a popularity contest too. But there's you know these are challenges that we need to to take on and. Um, you know, there's no metric. There's no one metric that's perfect. We need a diversity of metrics. Um, and, and we always have needed a diversity of metrics, um, but yeah. Very exciting. Anthony. Yeah, I, I appreciate Asia's, your um, emphasis on policy change, obviously. Um, and I think that uh, in addition, one the only other thing that came up for me as you were talking was uh, amicus briefs in court cases can be really impactful. And I know that um, that's been a big part of well, one of my co-authors work, um, Ezra Young, who does work with trans communities, okay, has an opportunity to be really impactful uh, on local, state, and national stages in the legal system. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Let's see, we have, let me check my list here. Um, we've got one comment uh, that I'll ask you to chew on a little bit. I'll probably form in a formal question here in a moment. We have one question was briefly touched on about public psychology and its application in COVID-19. I believe Neil, Neil talked about vaccine education, um, which is critical right now. And then there's a query about using public psychology to address the mental health crisis on campus. And speaking of COVID-19 is likely to be um, expanded because of the 
the um, impacts that um, the isolation of virtual school have had on young people who are now headed into um, to college debt. So I don't know if anyone needs a little time to think about that um, or not, if you want to weigh in, but we have some other questions about here. Um, what does the evidence say about science communication methods for demystifying psychology for the public? Any uh, comments about the knowledge base on that? Well, I will say that um, I don't think it's about persuading the public or defending science, right? The public doesn't need persuasion. It needs access and exposure and opportunity and engagement. And we don't need to defend science. We need to open it up, to collaborate, to lift the veil. Right? There's nothing for us to defend. We've been in a defensive posture trying to communicate how useful we are, especially as a, as a social uh, science, you know, psychology is mm -hmm. a social science. We've been in a defensive posture for a long time. We think we have a bad public image. We don't have a bad public image. We have practice that has problems um, from paywalls to jargon to concepts that just circle the ivory tower. Um, and that's how we get to public distrust of science. So I think it, it you know, it's more, it, the evidence shows self-persuasion. That's the most effective form of persuasion. Let people persuade themselves through experience with our science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, just quickly building on that. Um, I think one issue we do have um, is this, um, and I don't know where it necessarily comes from, but this idea that, yeah, we have all of the knowledge um, and it's for us to go and give it away. Um, and that's the way to engage with the public. And people know lots of things about their lives. Um, we can have, we can engage in conversations about that, uh, right? And um, thinking about um, and having conversations about different kinds of evidence, um, what is there, what's missing. Uh, I mean, um, some of the really um, productive discussions um, I have, which sort of cuts both ways is about not only what, um, you know, is in the literature, but what's missing from the literature because of who has been excluded from the production of the knowledge in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there we're learning something about the science as we're having um, these discussions, but then opening, um, opening up those conversations um, builds some of that trust um, and um, allows um, for sort of, yeah, broadening um, access, broadening participation, um, all of those things that um, Asia is noting are super important. Awesome. So I have a, a undergraduate curriculum question for you. If you were to, and take a minute to think about this, this is a big question, it wasn't on your list. <laughs> if you were to um, roughly outline the contents of an undergraduate course that focused on public psychology, what would it look like? Take a minute to think about that. Because this is because we know undergrads that's the that's the early part of, of 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 shaping what the future of the profession will look like. So, what are some of the things that you would want to see in a course like that? I think coming from sort of the clinical realm here, um, if it was a course in public psychology that had a clinical lens to it, I'd really want to emphasize a systems lens. So to recognize that mm -hmm. uh, mental health problems do not exist between the ears of our clients. They exist in this and manifest from the systems that they inhabit. And that like their socialization within systems of oppression oftentimes is what like manifests the like maladies that we see, the challenges that we see in therapy. So I think really emphasizing that systems lens in parallel with an emphasis on um, critical self-reflection. So understanding the ways in which we are socialized as clinicians in systems of oppressions uh, of oppression and how that impacts the ways that we experience our clients, we intervene with them, um, the directions we get, the biases that we have, the things we miss clinically with folks, um, and really taking that that critical lens of applying, applying it both outwardly and inwardly. Mm, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Um, would others like to weigh in? So one, uh, go ahead, go for it. Sorry, cut you off. No, um, I, I um, one of the undergraduate courses I teach um, is a course on persuasion and social influence. And the way that um, 
I often begin that class, um, especially in our research methods section, um, is asking students to think um, for the entire class about how do we know like what is and isn't so, right? Um, and, and what that does is um, it encourages them to really critically analyze everything else that I'm going to say for the rest of the semester. We're gonna talk about a bunch of studies. Um, as you're gonna read studies um, um, in this class, as you're reading them, pay very um, careful attention to details like who was in these um, studies, who was not in um, these studies, where were these studies run, um, what and what's missing, right? And I think um, thinking about all those details um, helps helps engage um, with the kind of processes we're talking about here from a public psychology perspective, right? Um, it, um, they're often bringing up um, issues about who needs to be included in the work in the future and um, how if we change the way that we go about conducting these studies, uh, we might reach very different conclusions about the world. And I think that kind of process is really helpful um, for um, students to go through and also then encourages them to push us um, you know, faculty members and other um, researchers um, to do better in the future. So going back to one of the earlier questions that you asked, um, Anthony, like it's not just graduate students um, changing the way that we do things, but also undergraduates demanding more of um, their professors, um, I think does a lot um, for pushing the work forward. Awesome, awesome. Asia, did you wanna add anything? I just have one tiny thing to add, cause I've been thinking about it a lot lately is, I would want to talk a lot about um, APA ethics in the class. Um, there's been, for a long time, we didn't really have very good ethical policies and, and then we developed some. Um, and it seemed like we focused to the present day mainly on non-malfeasance, right? Doing no harm. And, I, and I'd like to see us shift to focusing on beneficence um, yeah. and, and how to actually bring uh, participants and community members' welfare to the fore. Um, you know, I can tell you in my own research with my own IRB, I can say in my consent form, there are no direct benefits from participating in this study, right? Um, yeah. Is that okay? Is that really okay uh, for, for a public psychology? Um, we need to consider uh, the welfare of, of all of our clients and our um, participants and our um, community collaborators, first and foremost. Very good point. So one of our questions, um, I believe this was um, one of our guests from Brazil, if I think I have the country right. So they put in the Q&A, um, are the basic ideas of public psychology tied to Marx's vision of humans and events? Big question there. <laughs> Take a minute to think about that one. Yeah, as a labor organizer who has um, some affinity for those sorts of perspectives, um, I don't think it inherently does. And I do think that there is a materialist analysis um, to public psychology, like inherently um, endemic to public psychology that demands a look at how, for example, like material conditions produce uh, the dynamics that we see in our work, broadly speaking. I have another question um, sort of related to uh, uh, themes that we have covered today. So there's a huge demographic shift coming with respect to race and ethnicity um, in the United States. It's actually already underway. So um, census data tell us that um, for people under the age of 18, that it is already a majority black and brown population um, and uh, um, young people who are entering college. So this is the demographic of um, young people who are now entering college or entering our profession. And uh, roughly by the early 2040s, um, uh, the, univer the university, the, the country will be um, a majority uh, uh, people of color uh, um, country in terms of composition. And so um, so it doesn't seem to be a bit of an accident to me that we're having this conversation with this huge demographic shift underway. Um, what are the implications of that for how we um, think about the relevance of our field 
um, for the um, uh, very real social issues that the country is struggling through right now. And that question is to anyone who would wish to, to ask it. I think I can start. Um, and I think that change is part of um, what I mean, we're seeing some of it um, in the things that current graduate students um, and other um, early career people are pushing for in the field. Like, I, I don't think it's an accident that we're having this conversation now. Um, that when you look at the literature um, and you see what has been studied, what hasn't been studied, who has been included, who's been excluded. Um, I think there are a number of um, students now who are looking at it and like, I don't know that that actually reflects the reality uh, that I grew up with um, or um, of experience. Um, and that makes sense given, you know, all the meta scientific studies we've seen on, on psychology. Um, historically, it's been a science of wealthy white American undergraduates, right? And so now that the country is changing and um, the um, demographics in our classroom are changing and students are like, what? <laughs> um, I, I think that's why we're having this sort of reckoning in the field right now is that mm -hmm. um, it's a recognition that the field in some ways um, has failed in generating um, um, good understanding of um, the diversity of experiences that um, exist in the world. And so that's why we're having these conversations now and are having to rethink what the field is and what we do. And that's, uh, that's so insightful, uh, Neil, and I think you're exactly right. You know, when I look at my own graduate students and I have eight right now, and a lot of them um, are from underrepresented backgrounds in psychology and uh, they are by and large interested in pursuing research topics that affect and improve conditions for communities they care about and belong to. And uh, th that, you know, if you want a diverse science, you have to appreciate uh, uh, the interests and angles and expertise of um, uh, diverse contributors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think with that, you know, as, um, you know, somebody who embodies more, um, or I don't embody many minoritized identities outside of my sexual identity. And I think that's something that stands out to me uh, in terms of like how to stand in solidarity um, with my minoritized colleagues too is a recognition that like my liberation as a sexual minority person or uh, is intimately tied, inherently tied mm -hmm. to the liberation of my colleagues who are oppressed on other axes, right? Um, and I think that it's it's with that um, that we have to be committed uh, to action um, to support material and otherwise uh, to these efforts to shift these systems. If we want to put our ethical responsibility as a field into practice, whether we are members of those groups or not. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. And so I have each of your papers here. We have about. 12 minutes left, I may take us right up to the hour and we'll see how, how it goes. Um, so I'm going to go in order of the way you appear on my screen. Um, Neil, I'm going to start with you. Can you provide for the um, audience because there are many folks who are just hearing about this special issue for the first time. And so the title of your article was, is what counts as good science? How the battle for methodological legitimacy affects public psychology. And if you could give us like the headline and then when the issue dropped, as we like to say in hip hop culture, I saw your Twitter thread and you had a lot of personal reflections that I thought were just um, wonderful for the moment. If you could share a little bit of that with your audience to your personal comfort, of course. Yeah, um, so the paper, uh, my paper really focused on um, this tension um, in the field. I um, mean, again, um, for background, um, trained in social psych. so that um, guided a lot of what I wrote about, but um, a lot of it does generalize beyond that, about this debate between basic and applied research as um, if those are completely separate things and one is legitimate and the other is not um, in, in the discourse. Um, and how, do, how does each side like come up with um, different methods 
of generating knowledge, how do they evaluate knowledge claims, um, and how do they view the other side. So that's it's really that um, that debate that I walk through um, in the paper, um, but also its implications for who is represented um, at, at different um, um, levels, participants as researchers, um, as journal editors, as uh, funders, um, and so forth, and how all of these things are intertwined, and what are the implications for the um, not only the knowledge that we produce, but um, how that knowledge gets used in the world um, for to develop interventions, to develop the policies um, that govern our society. Um, we, that's really what the paper sort of walked through. Um, and so, you know, it's this broader um, epistemic analysis, but um, also has um, some personal relevance. I'm someone who, um, again, came up um, in this, uh, in a traditionally basic part of the, um, the discipline that faced a lot of pushback for my work being too applied um, as I was coming up. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, right, I, I took a job outside of the psychology department, right, um, to be able to do this work um, in an environment, in a discipline that does value it um, in a more holistic way. And so um, there's also this personal element uh, to it too. Yeah. I, I, I thank you for the, the comment about um, of being in a in a in a uh, academic unit that is not a psych department because I think that that also reflects a sort of subtle thread that happens that when we ask these um, questions with a real world and um, I would say social justice component to them that there's not always a home which says a lot because social psychology is usually one of the sub sub parts of our profession that they're absolutely in a department of psychology or psychological sciences, but that you, that your intellectual home as a, as a fully credential professional, you, you need kindred spirits and you're not finding them in our department. So that, that's, a, that's a thread that um, I'm familiar with in that, um, I, I wish I had very um, insightful comments, but I'm just gonna put a pin in that as, as something that I'm, that I'm noticing here. And Anthony, so the title of your paper is when the political is professional, civil disobedience in psychology, which, man, I can't wait to cite this. I'm like holding it right here. So please talk to me about the inspiration for this work and, and the headline for, for this piece in particular. Yeah, um, I really appreciate the, the glowing feedback. Um, it's, uh, it's been an incredible opportunity to be a part of this panel and to be welcome to the special issue as well. Um, I think what my co-authors and I focused on was uh, we each came come to psychology or come to the work that we do um, from different backgrounds, from different orientations towards work. But one of the threads that and the ties that binds us is in some degree of civil disobedience, of um, ref refusing complicity in harmful practices um, at the, in support of liberation in some form or another. And so uh, this ultimately, this paper arose out of my foundational ethics class um, for my graduate degree, along with my colleagues. And um, we, you know, we're sort of looking at what does the field have to say about civil disobedience? And as it turns out that there was tons of insights towards civil disobedience with regard to, uh, like from minoritized scholars, from feminists, from black scholars, from uh, native scholars, from folks uh, engaged in, in, in immigration struggles. Um, mm -hmm. However, in terms of what's formally ingrained in our ethics code and what's formally ingrained in APA guidance around civil disobedience, it was relatively minimal. And so what we look to do is to synthesize uh, existing perspectives both within and outside the field um, to inform psychologists navigation of civil disobedience and, and implementation of civil disobedience as a practice for transformative change. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, we did a systemic sort of analysis of the ethics code, looked at the ways it can inform civil disobedience, looked at the places where it continues to have shortcomings and proposed a number of uh, directions, uh, both for individual psychologists and students and for the field at large to go um, to really embolden civil disobedience, the refusal of, uh, the refusal to capitulate the harmful practices into our field um, and as a as the, you know a practice for transformative change. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to save my last question for the lead editor, um, Asia. So my question is a little bit different for you. Um, and I think this is for all of my students and early career folks who are out there um, who will cite this work. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about what it was like to put this together 
and um, put this out into the world. Because I, I, like I said, I think this is a groundbreaking um, issue. And so that'll be our final question for the day. But to talk a little bit about that process, because the cool thing about our work is that there was nothing and then we get to create something. We pull all of these cool ideas together that are, that are threads in these areas and that and pulling it together into a cohesive vision and getting it um, accepted in um, our flagship journal for our association. Can you talk a little bit about that for our early career folks who are trying to figure out how they can have their public site impact. Absolutely. Um, so the issue started as a panel at SPICI, Division 9 of APA, the psychological, uh, the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, SPICI, um, which is uh, a division I'm truly devoted to. Um, there was a small grant that SPICI gives out to allow people uh, to do essentially public psychology, to work with uh, local uh, communities, to change local and state policy. Um, and myself and Patrick uh, Grzanka and Michelle Schlofer were on that. And that's how it got started as we were talking about you know, psychology activism, consistent with sort of Kevin Nadal's conceptualization and citizen psychologist conceptualization. And then we realized there was, there was a, a potential for something bigger there. And we really developed the idea as we were reading the articles and the articles were being revised. It was um, fluid up until the end, it remains fluid. Um, and, you know, one thing that I want to leave people with is the knowledge that you can participate in public psychology incrementally in small ways. You don't have to do it all at once. Um, so let me give an example of a uh, program of research of mine that participates in public psychology in, in multiple ways. And, and you can do some and many and all of these as is appropriate to, you know, your ability um, and scope and uh, time. So I have partnered with Lotus House, which is the largest um, homeless shelter serving women and girls in the United States. And they wanted, they had questions and they wanted someone who could help them answer their questions. And, and one, of the, one of the things they really wanted was evidence of their effectiveness. They're a very effective organization, something like 80 percent plus of their graduates go on to independent living. This is phenomenal. They have ideas as to why. They provide an incredible support system. Um, they have a very unique culture and they wanted someone to help them establish an evidence base to show the world we, are, we have um, our arms around this problem. And I was like, okay, I'll help you. I have skills to do this. And um, we developed a memorandum of understanding. Okay. So that's like a public psychology principle where they own everything. They own all the data. I can't do anything without them, um, which is fully appropriate. I can't publish. I can't do a poster. I can't do a talk without, uh, engaging with them. We did, um, uh, we used qualitative methods, which were the most appropriate to, to their participants. Um, and, you know, they were, they came from multicultural orientation. We have a, a paper on multicultural orientation in the special issue. We practice things like cultural humility and, and, and taking advantage of cultural opportunities in these um, focus groups that we conducted. Um, Lotus House ended up co-writing the paper with us. They are an author on the paper. The last author is Lotus House. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, um, I communicated this to the public recently through an NPR segment with the academic minute, right? So communicating this, and they're also using this paper, they have it on their website and they are um, using it to advocate for their culture and their policies and their practices to be adopted more widely. So there's many opportunities for, for you to participate in this. And even, you know, one thing I was thinking about when Anthony was talking was how you know, even in a faculty meeting, you can change the conversation. Even, even what you say in a faculty meeting can change the conversation from focusing on this person's grant dollars or the number of publications to what people are doing in the community uh, for students, for social structures. Um, 
you know, just by asking questions and being curious, right? So, so what is this supposed to demonstrate? Can this demonstrate that as well, right? Um, that, that alone will help us move, move things forward. You timed that perfectly, Asia. Um, this has been a great conversation. You're getting a lot of love in the chat. I don't know if you've been able to digest that while um, preparing your responses, but I wanna thank all of our guests from around the world and from my dear colleague, Peggy, for providing the tech assistance for this meeting. This has been an essential science conversation by the American Psychological Association. Please join us for the next one. And thank you so much to our panelists.